All right. Uh, good to be here. Back down under. Um, the presentation is about 30 minutes. Everyone that is sitting up in the stands has their own agenda. There's a, a, a blank, and you want it filled in terms of information, and you go on your way. Uh, at no point would any of the information be, well, hey, I'm not doing that, but I should do that. No, be yourself, take what is necessary, low-hanging fruit, and be happy. All right? Um, so the presentation's about what you can collect, not what I can give you, uh, as far as that goes. I'll have a whole host of ideas, and I'm on the side of the equation of behavior, understanding your players, the humanistic side. Uh, you can go to Google and get any pick and roll drill that you want. You can get a multitude of things. You can slow mow it and write it down and really do a good job with the drilling or the things. I call them things, and then there's people. And so if I err, I want to err on the side of helping the players be at their maximum and what can it get through to them so that there's no interference. And so you're talking about taking a lot of information and reducing it down, just like a good cook. There's reduction involved, there's heat or friction involved, and you want to apply that friction competition at the right time. But not everything can be competitive because there's got to be a clear understanding of what you're trying to get across. And the most important thing, you, the coach, is that you operate on a certain amount of energy in any given day. You want to guard your energy and be really, really efficient with how you're going to move your energy up and down. And again, if you said, what's the goal? As much as possible, be consistent. And if you're somebody that the RPMs are up and you like to be emotional, then don't be uh, brutal on yourself for being who you are with a loud voice and you're up and down the floor. And if that's who you are, <clears throat> then be that, but be disciplined about it. And discipline, if you erase the, the word, is essentially being consistent. How can I be consistent in any given day? And you'll find that your champions are driven by the fuel of consistency and self-sacrifice. So that's just a quick introduction. The other part is you as a coach, is where's the joy? Because basically, you're imparting information, you're trying to get a collection of people to operate together. So that means sacrifice. What will you slide forward, the player, in order for our team to operate as a we, as opposed to a me? Yet some players come through the door and their parents raise them to be a shooter. And so understanding the psychic of a shooter, that they're gonna shoot a lot, and so, they're different than somebody that is raised as a giver, maybe a point guard who overpasses the ball but doesn't shoot enough for your liking. <clears throat> so there are some differences here in terms of personality, but what's not different is how they show up and how consistent they are in the output of their mental, their focus, and their physical of what they're going to do in order to run a certain time. Example given, are you a coach that knows that your player, say Brian Gorgian, can run from one end to the other in a certain time and then expect that time that that's a PR, a personal record, so that you know their personal record so when they're having an off day, you can go to that personal record and you can say, hey, you're not up to snuff. You know, this is not happening. And you say, is that an understanding that we have? Yeah. Okay, we'll get to whatever the reasons are outside the court, but right now we all have to perform. And if we're going to take it to the nth degree, the surgeon goes in, they're operating on your child, there's got to be a certain behavior and energy and focus to the surgeon in order to perform on your child. Well, there's no less expectation on the teacher-coach in order to perform in a given day, because when you lose a practice, you lose a game. You can't afford to have that session be a screw around session where you don't get something done. You're going to have to have goals and you're going to have to try and achieve those goals. And it's that simple. It's winning 
it's losing and there's no difference. The one thing that doesn't have a conscience is the scoreboard. All right? It doesn't have anything to do with the conscience. You either win the game or you lose the game and you move from that understanding and you say, okay, well, there are four types. There's the good loss where they perform to their maximum and you played a superior athletic team that they were well coached, but you guys lost at the buzzer. Well, if you're going to go away and say there's no such thing as a good loss and your people maxed out their thing, then you're going to go in, throw a fit, and you're going to lose the spirit of the players that gave what you felt was their all, but it just wasn't good enough. Well, you're going to end up running your head into a wall six years later. You're going to be a miserable SOB because you're always preaching about perfect practice makes perfect. And a perfectionist is no fun to be around. I will tell you right now, they're heartbreakers. Because the sun comes up and it's a beauty, and you go, yeah, but, you know, there was this cloud over to the left. And I've had players that are perfectionists. I had a kid named David Barlow. Never got a B in his life. Absolute perfectionist, and until he could miss, he wouldn't leave the gym. So he wanted to make himself miserable. And I'm just going to leave the story there, but it was a process to get him to drop the perfectionism in order to find joy to compete and be who he could be. And it was a long process. I'll leave that for another day. My point is, is that understanding the athlete, but more importantly, and most importantly, understanding who you are. And can you run this race to the point of being a teacher-coach to the point where you want to leave it on your own terms. That's a glorious career, be it a teacher, be it a doctor, whatever, as you say, I'm going to land this plane, put it on the tarmac gently, and that's the way we want to go. My point is that we do so many things and we learn so many myths that are out of line. You know, you're carrying your father and your mother's lessons and then their aphorisms and sayings at the dinner table that are absolutely wrong. And it's your job to untie those knots and relearn a better way to do those things. Example given, your son takes a hammer to his, his thumb at three years old and you're going to go over because this is what your dad said, you tough it out, you'll be okay, you know, a little pop on the forehead as opposed to getting down on one knee and saying, hey, that must have hurt, and validating that little guy and saying, hey, that goes into the cup of self-esteem. No, everything's got to be internalized, it's got to be held, and the only lesson the kid learns is how to keep it all inside until there's a collision and he can't articulate with his spouse about what's going on and why he's screwing up on that day. Tough guy? Maybe. Screwed up inside? For sure. And what I'm saying is the things we do as a coach and understanding human behavior is of the utmost importance. And if you don't place value on it and you're not aware of it, then how can you approach it? Like for example, if I say to you, I want everybody here to look for the number 22. All right, and I want you to do it for the next week. I promise you that everybody here will call me and say, oh my God, this 22 just keeps popping up because the awareness has been planted within you to look for it, and that is the power of awareness. And when you're a coach, you're either moving the chains and understanding how your athletes operate, or you're not. And it's complicated. But it's your job to reduce it down and say, okay, here's what I understand, here's what I'm observing, and yes, you can teach body language. Body language of winning, body language of losing, body language of not getting the 50-50 ball on the ground. All right? Guys, you can have a seat for a second, just relax, and then I'll come get you and we'll hit it. All right? Give me five minutes. Okay. And young ladies, thank you. Uh, so my, my point is, is that a little bit of information is a dangerous thing. Yeah, you've got to do your reading. Yeah, you've got to watch other great coaches, etc. All right, so for example, I'm going to have you pair up. You don't have to move your seats, but stand up and pair off with somebody. Just do that, eyeball them, just pivot, and it's two people standing like this. Just pair up. Pick somebody and pair up, but please stand up. All right, I want one person to put their hand like this. All right, put your notebooks down. You don't need them. All right, and I just want you to hit your fist three times on the palm of your hand. One, 
Yeah, just you can do it. There you go. We're going to pay, play paper, rock, scissors. All right? And we're going to go the best out of three. Okay? Best out of three. And you say, well, how do we do that? You get to go one, three times, the other one goes three times, and we'll go to six. That way, you guys can say, okay, I was the winner four times, this person won two, and we'll go there. So each person gets three whacks at it. All right, here we go. All right, you're calling it. Here we go. Both go together. Paper, rock, scissors. Both go together. All right, Gorgian, you were the winner. You had fist. That breaks scissors. Here we go. Paper, rock, scissors. Those people that won, go pick a different partner. It's two partners up. Paper, rock, scissors. Who's win the best out of three? Here we go. Here we go. Have a go. Have a go. Pick somebody. All right, now I want you to go back to your same partner, all right? Gorge, your hands are going to be on the bottom. Billy, your hands are going to be on the top. All right, you've got to bring him over the top and get a hit of flesh on the top of the hand. If he pulls away before and you whiff, then he gets to be on the bottom, you're on the top. You're going to go until I say stop. Here we go. Watch. All right, did you get him? That's one for you. Here we go. Let's go again. Good. Did you get him again? Yeah. All right. God, nice hands. Did you get him again? All right. I'm lightning. Now, oh, now that's three tries. Now, Billy, you're on the bottom. All right, you get three tries. Whack them hard. Here we go. You get three three tries a piece. Right, exactly. All right, have a seat real quick. All right, there are a couple three things. Don't ever leave the fun behind. And the point is that there's an element of competition there with paper, rock, scissors. There's an element of competition in that if you close your eyes and listen, there's some laughter going on. And you want to salt that into your practices. And if you see that competition isn't fun for somebody, then you know you're going to have to get to them because whatever happened where that player comes to you and you're coaching them, competition has been a journey of misery for them. And there should be joy to the competition. There should be joy to playing. There should be joy to every given day that you coach. And if you're going and you're running uphill and you're saying, hey, man, I just don't like this anymore. It's not worth it. The kids are this, this, or this. It's because you didn't take time on the day to have a cup of coffee to review maybe 15 minutes of what made you happy. So now you have a tough day, a miserable day, where everything was against you, and it turned out to be a goose egg at anything that you attempted. The principal's upset with you. The doctor's upset with you. It could be anything. There's still joy to be had in a given day. And you have to seek it, find it, to fill yourself up so that at the end of the trail or in the middle of the trail, you fatigue. And you say, I don't like this. 
This is terrible. It's awful. <laughs> and my wife always says to me, attitude reflects leadership. And so how you position yourself to have a great day is always how you wake up and you prep yourself to go outside the door. There's a book out by Elrod, Hal Elrod, called The Miracle Morning. And the essence of it is an anacronym called Savers. And it's something that I've done for years. I had a baseball coach tell me to read the book. It's about 110 pages. It's a simple read. All right? And this, this young man who was 22, 23 sold knives. And he was really good at it. And for that company, he was the best. And he had a head on. He was in critical care for a year in the hospital. And so when he came to, and he stuck there trying to heal, and they, you know, life and death and all of that, he created an anacronym that he said, mentally, I need to position myself to go through this anacronym. So S is silence. Give yourself some silence in the morning where you take stock. One is where you're at and where you want to go on that day. All right, so some people meditate, some people deep breathe, whatever fancies you in order, but with intent, you have silence. A is affirmation. What saying am I going to create or am I going to borrow from somebody else that's going to load my gun so that I'm mentally ready to be optimistic and positive? When all that stuff comes at you, am I going to counterpunch that with a saying? Mine is, be positive, I say to myself, talk positive, regardless. All right? Second thing is, think positive, and whatever is coming that way, okay, well, how do I counter that? What, what am I going to do with whatever is here? You know how many times you're with people, and all of a sudden, they just tilt the conversation to negative? They're predisposed to that. It, it, it's a fact. It happens at the coffee shop this morning. I go there, somebody stepped in front, they made the order, they're bitching about how long it took for the coffee to come out, you know, and I'm hearing this. My wife Molly was behind me, and I turned, and I said, now we get a chance to make a good decision, all right? It's going to take a while for that cappuccino to go out, but she's really good at flat white, at getting the flat white out. So I said, you know, I saw what was going on, and I gave her something that we were going to do that would make it easier for somebody that was serving coffee, and I was in my own world. That's called a counter, all right? V, visualization. If you can't see where you're going, how can anybody else? So you say to yourself, I was born in Fairbanks, Alaska. Less than 30,000 people, all right? Freezing cold. Nobody has lived north of me. All right, Magnavox, the Huskies, Washington Huskies are playing. I remember getting my chops busted for always listening to the Huskies. And next to the Magnavox, I had it turned down and my parents were in bed. You know, and I wanted to listen to the game. The Haas brothers, all right, the land of Lenny Wilkins. All right, a lot of things happened out of Seattle. Bob Hubricks. All right, there's George Mikan and Bob Hubricks as far as the hook went. My point is, is that that was a visualization, and I was saying to myself, I'm going to get out of here, and I want to go play ball in the United States. We, were, yeah, we call it the lower 48. We were the 49th state. My point is, is that there was a dream, but there was a visualization. And any time that rejection happened, I said, OK, what am I thinking? How am I going to paint that picture? My point is, it's not my vision. It's your vision. What's your vision? You know, and if you can, it doesn't have to be something grand, but what's your vision on the day? I just don't want to be a dud. I want to have energy for people, and I want them to plug into me and take my energy, and we're, we're done. That's what I want. I mean, it's important to me. I'm out of the game. I'm 66 years old. I'm good. You know what I'm saying? But I want to give it all away. That's my vision. So I'm here in Australia, giving it away. All right, now we go to, to E, exercise. If you don't plan it, you won't do it. So if you're going to be a walker, walk. Walk a block. I have a buddy that's it's bigger than a house. He has trouble with his heart. And I said, Charlie, the problem is that you get these workout guys and you do all this stuff and you auger in. 
I said, just walk around the block once. Just do that for a month. Forget about the rest. Something you can achieve. My point is, is that exercise, the older you get, the more important it is, the law of relativity. So you can battle it. You got to do it, okay? So we get to the R, reading. If you want to transfer yourself from a small town in Alaska and you want to travel, well, then grab a book. I mean, I couldn't get out of where I was for a number of reasons. So that led me to books. So that my point is, you want to be a great coach? Read greatness. Read about Pat Riley and the winner within. And it goes on and on. There's so many books on, on coaching methodology. Read. All right? You've got film. You've got Google. You've got YouTube. It's crazy what you can access, but do it. All right? S is scribe. Saver. Scribe. Means journal. Write things down. The writing down takes broad focus and puts it into fine focus. You have to take big thoughts, and when you write, and you have to write a paper, you can't write everything that you think. So you have to organize your thoughts. It teaches you to be sequential, and that's the same thing as coaching. All right, and I could go on about the journaling, but it's cathartic. It's something that you need to do, and it documents. It actually holds you accountable to what you're doing. So if you say that I'm a workout person, then write down what you do. And when you're missing those days and you haven't, you're not able to write them down, then it allows you not to fib to yourself. So there's your savers. And my point is that I think that that's really important that you take care of yourself. Take good care of yourself because you're going to have the many that are going to need you as the point person to be organized and put together because when you're scattered, they're going to be scattered. Come on down. Here we go. Quickly. In line. To the in line. I don't know what you guys call that out of bounds line. All right. Let's bring it around in a half moon. You're here. You're here. I'm going to say this low. All right, now, if I'm going to expect you to do things, I'm going to have to be clear in my instructions. Okay? So as a favor to me, I want you to go from half court and come back in the very same places, but do it at a reasonable rate. Not sprinting, but not walking. Go to half court and come back. Okay, so I'm telling you what I want, right? Right? Coach, show me. So I take off. All right, does anybody not understand? And, and you might not. So you're going to run to half court and you're going to come back to these spots. All right, so I've told you. I've showed you. Now you're going to show me. And if there's any correction, number four, I'm going to correct it, and then we're going to rep it out so there's a clarity of understanding. Okay, do you want to get rid of the reps on that one? Do you want to, like, not do the reps? I know I wouldn't want to do them. I can get this done the first time. Okay, can you do it the first time? So there's a challenge on you. I think you can. You're well coached. And statement of expectation. All right, ready, go. Same spot. All right, I have one question for you. Uh, open up so we're shoulder to shoulder. Good job, you guys. Not a problem. Can we do it better? Yes or no? Can we do it better? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Ready, go. All right, now I'm going to put another log on the fire, and I'm going to ask somebody or everybody to use their voice to get us into the spots. So on your way back, somebody say, you're here, you're here, you're here, or everybody does it, or some do it. Can we do that? 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. And I want you to point when you're talking. Ready? Go. Okay. Close ranks and take one step towards me. Unbelievable. Really, really good. Like not even close. I go all over the world to coach and you guys are right on point. Can we keep doing that? Yeah. Okay. I would like for you, uh, there are how many people here total? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Okay, you two are going to be subs. I want four lines, one there where the green and the yellow meet, same there, and then two in the corners of how many? Four. All right, so we have four people, you know, four lines. How many people are we going to have? Three. three, right? Right, let's go three lines, okay? Got it? You sure you do? All right, we're going to play cutthroat, so let's see you do it. Here we go. I need a voice. I need somebody to organize us. There's three there. Good. Fine. There's three there. Fine. There's four here. There's three here. You're all right. No, 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 no. Don't do that. You're good to go. Both of you go over there. It's fine. Okay. Three. We got three there in a sub. We've got three here and three here. All right. We good with that? We good with that? Yes or no? I can't hear you. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. You guys hang tight. Okay. The five laws of learning and setting the stage for them is one, tell them what you want. Okay. Number two is... Have them tell you what you told them, all right? Number three is, all right, I, and I demonstrate. So tell them, then show them, then have them show you what you told them. Number four is correct the demonstration. And number five, Lord and Master, is repetition. One, tell them. Two, show them. Three, what was it? Right? All right, we're going to... Have them do what we showed them. Number four is I'm going to correct it. There are always is something that needs a little bit of a touch-up. And number five is repetition. So when they were in the huddle, I went through the five laws of learning and did it in a calm way and got their permission. There are a lot of things that are sub-points with each point. When you tell them, there's a way to tell them. You can actually tell them by asking them questions. Do I have permission to coach you? Yes. Okay. Can you go from one spot to another in a reasonably quick way? Yeah. Good. Let me show you how I want it. So now I demonstrate it. Then I said, you demonstrate that. And then they go, well, mm -hmm. good. Or on law number three. Or it's a little bit slower than you want. And you say, I think we can do quicker than that. Do you think we can do quicker than that? And they go, yeah. So now we're already enlisting them. We're working together. It's not just me giving them things. And then as you saw, I said, can you guys point as you're coming back to the spots? And now one of the hardest things to get, as everybody knows in the gym, is communication consistently. Communication is habit. And when you see in a gym a team that talks all the time, you know that there have been hours spent on it. It's really hard to get that. Communication, verbals, all of that. Okay, and so that's basically what we had happen. All right, four people come out, walk out outside the three-point line, please. For the front of each line, you're a team. Okay, now you guys hustle to the end of the line. Go back to the same line, but go to the back. All right, next group, run out. Good. All right, now you run to the end of the line. Next group, run out. Good. Now you run to the end of the line. Next group, run out. Now, good. Okay, now you go to the end of the line. Okay, the power of verbals. Okay, sprint. I'm going to have them sprint. First group up, sprint out and back. Go. 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 
Go! Okay. Um, everybody go back to the horseshoe you were in. Hustle to your spots, please. Quickly, five, four, three, two, and one. Anybody here upset with me? No. Not Dev, I disrespected anybody. No. No. I know one thing, you've respected me. And I want to thank you for that. That was really good, and I appreciate it. And I'm not taking it for granted, and I'm not being patronizing. And I want to start this relationship off the right way. So I think he did a great job. So when there's a violation, and I blow the whistle, and there will be a violation, just sprint to the end of the line. No drama at all. And then coach each other on the mistakes that you're going to make. All right? We call it the mistake recovery system. All right? Mistake recovery system. Misses. All right? And basically, we're saying that, hey, any mistake that's corrected is a good mistake if we learned. So we have this mistake recovery system. I might even put my hand out and you made a mistake and you had a turnover. And I go like that. That's part of us saying, okay, I need to pass the ball to the outside hand. So we're going to drop and go. We're going to correct the mistake and then we're going to leave it where it's at, go there with no chins to sternum. Bad body language. Well, like we got a dote on that. It's a next play kind of thing, right? Yes or no? Yeah. I can't hear you. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, because the only reason I say I can't hear you is because you have to have a loud voice. This is 94 by 50. People are in the gym and you've got to talk loud to get your point across because this is the way the game's built. True or false? True. All right. Louder. True. Louder. True. All right. Somebody say, uh, for purposes of this, you're a man. Just say it. And point. Say everybody together on ready. Ready. You're a man. Do it louder, quicker, and lock your elbow out. Really point. Ready. Go ahead. That's the way you, the beginning of defense, where you're saying, hey, I've got him. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're teaching that now. All right, first group out. Here we go. All right, chill. Give me, give me about two minutes. We're setting the stage, and at no time... Am I hyperventilating where I was doing with them was setting the concrete. And in order to set your concrete, you've got to do a good job of leveling the earth. You've got to do a good job with your gravel. You've got a good job with your boxing and how you do your two by fours and your rebar. And you've got to do all of it at the right, at the right pace. You've got to know what you're doing or that concrete will crack, it'll chip it will be a bad foundation. Well, the coaching is the same way. And if you think you're in a hurry, all right, and you've got to get to something else, that's your first mistake. And my point is, go slow. I have a whole host of 20 leadership points. I have another baker's dozen, but 14 points for you. I'm probably not going to get it done, and I really don't care. My job is to present at the pace of whatever is here and do a great job with them so I can lay the foundation, the methodology. And I think the biggest mistake coaches make is they get in a hurry. So if you build your practice plan and you have like six things, then write it again and have four things. Then write it again and have two things. And then write it again and say, if we get this one thing done in this practice, it's been a great practice. In other words, I think, well, we've got to do uh, special situations, out of bounds, under, then we've got to go side out of bounds, and then we're, and it's, you know, the next thing you know, you're going crazy because you're watering your own practice down. All right? I'm going to set them in a game called cutthroat. You've seen it, the majority of you have, because Coach Showalter came through here and did it, and other people have done it, and it's been on film, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm going to show you a couple things that it just throws a little bit of Cajun spice in there, a little cayenne, if you will, to, to, to spice this thing up a little bit and just trust my instincts as opposed to saying, well, you know, I've got to show them uh, a shakes, how to get into shakes, how to, how to, how to do uh, Spain, how to do Zoom, how to do... Those are things. You can, you can handle that. 
But my point is, is that I'm going to see some problems out here, and I'm going to put them in harm's way, and then I'm going to coach them through that. And if you said, well, give me something, how are you going to do that? Addition by subtraction. I'm constantly working on how to simplify things so that whatever they're doing, they do it extremely well. Extremely well. And then, if you said, what's offense? It's move and it's counter. If you do this defensively, then I'll do that. And if you do that, then I'll do this. Teaching them to slow themselves down and not hurry up. I can get them to go hard and you go, oh my God, you know, that was so intense and it was so good. You know what that is? That's Barnum and Bailey. That's circus stuff. That's, that's ego. So I want to manufacture, all right, some pressure here with them and some problems. And so now you say, well, you kind of got them organized here. Let me ask you this. Have you ever written down five ingredients to a great drill? Well, number one, there's got to be some time to it. Two minutes, four minutes, eight minutes, because you've got other things to do, right? So you put time on your drill. Score. Score it. Short scores. You know why? Because then you have the winning point every other point if you go to two or three. Don't go to long scores. So now you've got the game point and you are applying an overload principle where you're putting them under heavy pressure for the game. And then they get a tick either winning or they get a tick losing. And so how many ticks you can get will tell you your rotation of your players, who mixes well, who plays well, etc. And you can have somebody that's really sexy looking and can run and jump and like that, and he or she is always involved in losing. And I'm not saying drop them for dead, but what I'm saying is that when you're trying to win the game, you're going to put sexy in there and you're going to lose the game. And you have to be smart about how you do that and how you teach somebody who loses all the time and how the steps to winning. Sometimes you get across the line and sometimes you don't. Okay, so that's a lot of yakking. Let me stop now and let you ask a question. A pregnant pause. And when I get like this, this is what happens with the audience. They go, oh, shit, I don't want to ask him a question because, you know, he'll give me an answer that, that makes me look like I'm, I'm, you know, I don't know anything. You know what? All of you know more than I know. I know that as a fact because you're in your element, your environment, you have your players, and I know for a fact you know way, way more than I know. And I say that, that, forget the false humility. I just know it's true, and I believe that. But my thing is, is that I'm going to do something here. I'll show you what I mean. All right, Peter, you have a question. Go ahead. Coach, how much time early would you focus on the method, on how you want to teach and how you expect them to learn? If there were a number and the number were 10, 70% of the time is going to be on concepts and method. And then I would take a simple drill like cutthroat and let them play and enjoy the game and have some of that happy. But then coach them, you know, in terms of time and score. And I was on number three is rotation. Offense to defense to the end of the line, or defense to offense to the end of the line. Here are the sub points they don't tell you. Don't interrupt. Let them play it out. Let them play it out. Stop interrupting the drill. The other thing about rotation is, is that teach them when they're at the end of the line. Stop. That you could stop your drill if you have to, I'm, you know, break glass situation. But most of the time, let them get to the end of the line, let them have an assistant who needs to have responsibility and feel good about him or herself, let them do the correction and you keep the drill moving. You get the masses going up and down and let them do the fixing over there. And it feels good if you're the assistant to be involved like that. So that was number three in terms of concepts of a good drill. All right, number four is. Teach to your advantage. So make it brutally simple. There's still, there's been no contact. Because I want them to understand, so that's teaching to the advantage. I want them to look good as they're doing the drill and feel good. And then we'll get to the overload, which means that there's fewer offensive players than maybe defensive. And now we're flipping it so the game becomes harder and harder and harder. That's an overload principle. But right now, we're going advantage, disadvantage, and I'm going to teach to the advantage. That's number four. 
Number five is communication. Every drill, put the responsibility back on the players. If you've got a talker in the four, you'll figure it out and you say, hey, I, and you say, well, what about the other? You've got to teach them how to talk. Yeah, but first, you need to find your alphas or your talkers that are a little more bravado, they have a little more bravado, and they can talk because they're comfortable. There are some people that are introverts, and we're going to get them to talk. We're going to give them the huddle, and we're going to teach them about leadership. But some of them do it in a different way, and it, there's got to be some modeling. All right. Number six, in any drill, it involves rebounding. Rebounding is a pain in the rump. But you've got to do it, either offensive rebounding or, of course, defensive rebounding. You can do all this work, and your defense can be pristine and perfect, almost, and then your opponent gets the offensive board, and it breaks the morale of all the little things that you do. So you need to spend time on it, but it's gritty, it's dirty, and it's some of those things that we forget about consistently in the practice. But you're going to have to have those elements within any given drill time. Score. What was number three? Say it loud. Rotation. Right. Rotation. You know, offense to defense in the line or defense to offense in the line. Let them know, and then they'll do the rotation for you. What was number four? Advantage. What's that? Advantage. Right. Advantage, disadvantage. We got that. Yeah. Well, we got communication. Yeah. And then what do we have last? Rebounding. Right. What are the elements of a good drill? Create your own drill with your own players. Okay. All right. Um, you have no dribble, eyes to the rim, jump stop on all your catches. Anytime somebody throws you a pass, all right, or you throw a pass, you cut to the rim. Put your head underneath the net. And if you get an assist, you have to point to them. As you score, turn and point to them. If you violate any of those rules, your team is off. Now we'll go four on O. I'm going to teach the advantage. All right, let's say we'll do this for five minutes. I'll put myself on the watch, and we're going to go five minutes, okay? And they're going, what'd you say? All right, no dribble. Anytime that you have the ball in your hands, you have to put both eyes on the rim. That's rule number two. What was rule number three? Anytime you pass the ball, do you have to stand, or do you cut to the rim? Beautiful, all right? What if you get an assist and you score it, either on the perimeter or at the rim. You say, good pass. Good pass, but you have to say it, good pass. All right, so we're starting with the communication. Got it? Okay, you four coming out on defense when I say, but right now we're going to rehearse this with no defense at all. Ready? All right, next on, let's go, ball here. Here we go, play. Violation, eyes never went to the rim when you cut the ball. Ball here, throw it to me quickly. Next, here we go. Let's go, jump stop, square up. A violation, eyes never went to the rim, here we go. Next up, here we go. Good, cut. Here we go. Good. Play. Play. I can't hear you. There we go. Here we go. Next up. Uh, hold up. You lost a point. Okay. The ball's got to come back to me in the air. Why? What do I want to do? Say it loud. What's that? Want pace to the drill. Pace. So on and off. So when you score or there's a violation, throw me the ball. No eyes to the rim. Here we go. Next up. Let's go. Play. Violation. No eyes to the rim. Here we go. Triple threat. Eyes to the rim. Good. Here we go. Cut. Good. Didn't get underneath the net. Rim cut. Here we go. Next up. Okay. All right. So you can see that we can clean a lot of things up and we can get it the way we want. I'm, there'll be a mistake or two. You say, hey, that person didn't get their eyes to the rim, etc. I got all that. All right. Now, defense is going to come on. Come on on defense. 
All right, if you get a stop or you don't score, you go to the end of the line. Defense goes to offense. We good? Yep. All right. Are you, are you listening? Yep. All right, switch men. Go. Yep, switch. No, nope, there was no communication by you. Your team's off. Here we go. You stay on offense. Let's go. Hustle out. Oh, you guys lollygagged. Give out. Let's go. Next. Let's go. Move out. Get in a stance. Hands up. Let's go. Nah, 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 nah. Let's go. D, get out of here. Let's go. Point. Point to who you have. All right. Use your voice. Amen. There we go. Here we go. Let's go. Here we go. Let's go. All right. Uh, back in your lines. Great job. Ball here. Okay. The single hardest thing to do is get we out of your team. So if you want to get we quickly, then number the dribbles to zero. One, two, three. And you'll get we very quickly. So now you say, well, you know what? I'm, I'm coaching older players, and they're going to not like that. Then pick two or three players that can handle the ball, and you say, you get three, you get three, and you get three. Nobody else gets the dribble. Okay, you can have four, but they have to be north and south, and we got no tap dancing or anything with the ball, uh, and you can go coast to coast. Play north and south, attack when you want, we're good, use the pick and roll, you know, and now all of a sudden you have attackers with the dribble, and you have some that probably don't are not rip-and-go players. They will get there, but you're trying to win early and often so that you do a little bit of a hybrid, all right? And so I'm just going to do something out of my pocket right now. You can kind of get the gist of everything. You know, you probably do this in your practice, et cetera, et cetera. Good, all right? We're going to go full court, all right? So come to half court. Come to half court, all right? You are going to be on offense, and you're going that way. You're going to be on offense, and you're going that way. You stand there. I'm going to throw you the ball. All right, give me four defenders. Hustle out. Let's go. All right, All right you guys are defending that basket. OK? All right, um, we're going to make it really difficult for them. And I'm just going to guess. I'm going to let you have three dribbles, and you have three dribbles. You have no dribbles. You have no dribbles, OK? All right. You have three dribbles back. All right. You have three dribbles back. Got it? Nobody else has to dribble. What do you get to do? You do? Yeah. All right. Let's play. Go, go, go! Play it, play it. Let's go, let's go. All right, bring it over. Hustle over. Quickly, quickly. It's all right. No problem. Way to get out. All right, did you have the dribble? Did I give you the dribble? Did you have three dribbles? Was I, You were one of the guys that I said, you got three dribbles, yes or no? Yeah. Good. Could you have done that in one? Yeah. Could you have done that in three? So you got out in front, but you were off balance. So maybe if you took another dribble, pump fake, shoulder in, gone, hurry doesn't work, does it? You did a great job of getting out, right? So should you have balanced yourself, or should you have gone faster? Yeah, yeah, but I love the fact that you got out. Are you hearing that? That was fantastic. OK, you six, or eight, rather, run down to the other end. All right, next group's out. Well, here we go. All right, give me four more. You guys are attacking this basket here. All right, nobody has the dribble. Let's go. Come on, talk. 
Here we go. Drop the ball, violation. Go, let's go. Going the other way. No rim cut, violation going the other way. Go. Stay on the floor. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Play it. Go. Play it. You're all right. Freeze. Stay where you're at. Hustle back. D, go with them. All right? Okay. Opposite middle. Who's on offense? Okay. You can finish up. They don't have a dribble. How could you help this? Okay, where? To the split line. There's a yellow line from tip of the rim to tip of the rim. Run. All right, good. All right, now throw it there. All right, now you see that. What are you supposed to do? Find the sideline. Find the sideline. Play from there. Go! Let's go! What are you doing? Get over there. You're back here. First name? I can't hear it. Darius. How do you spell it? D-A-R-I-U-S. Good. All right. Now, as soon as the ball hits his hands, flash. Okay. Look opposite. Here we go. Phil. Play. Let's go. Cut. Play it. New four out, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Okay. Uh, go have a seat wherever. Get a drink of water. But before you do that, line up here. Line up. Face the audience quickly, quickly, shoulder to shoulder. Let's move you out this way. Scoot down, scoot down, scoot down, scoot down, scoot down. All right. Loud. Say your name. Where you're from. Emma. Wait, like, where? Like... That's your audience. I'm not your audience. Step forward. Wait, what do I say for Say you? your name and where you're from. Emma, my country? Uh, uh, no, your town. Oh, oh uh, Tamara. Okay, now let's do it again, and let me show you the five laws of learning. Mike Dunlap, Fairbanks, Alaska. Emma, Tamara. Okay, oh, body language. That's all that is, is bashful. And in order to play this game, you have to be an actor. And so we tell them, you don't have to change your personality per se. You just have to take the role of, of being fierce, being aggressive. And so instead of denigrating and saying, you know, like, what is that? No, we, we model it and we keep working on that because she's going to be that way in the huddle. She's going to be that way at the end of the game when she gets the ball. Well, coach, I, you know, I, no, 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 you can win the game. You can win the game. I know you can. And to be that coach when you lose the game and the player missed the shot or they made a mistake or a turnover, you want to be that coach. You got, you got to be that coach. Are you going to, like, bypass mistakes? No, you'll show them the film. But you want to say, hey, what'd you learn there? Good. Well, when that happens the next time, I know you're going to win it. That's the person, that's the persona you as the coach wants to have. Understand, I want you to do a little bit better. You know, and don't hurry. Just step, take your time, breathe, uh, and tell them where you're from. But first, tell them your name. Step out. Emma, and I'm from Tama. Okay. Now I want you to do it with a louder voice. Emma, and I'm from Tama. So good. So, so friggin' good. All right, go ahead. Tori, and I'm from Sutherland. Good. Um, Angela, and I'm from Kenneth. Great. Uh, Darius, I'm from Atlanta. Um, Evan, and I'm from Sydney. Great job, Evan. I'm Sam, and I'm from Paddington. I'm Josiah, and I'm from Canton. I'm Ash, and I'm from Maryland. Kobe O'Kelly, from Leighton. Great job. Ovi from Starmore. Coronet from Sydney. I'm Nicola from Manly. All right, give him a hand. Bring it over. Uh, thank you. You guys are great. 
and I know that if, if we, I'm on the clock, if I had time, we would really uh, compete and make it go. <laughs> Good job, you guys. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right? Okay. All right, a Q&A just on that little bite of the apple. I've got some things for you on leadership and some other things on coaching that I want to hit. Uh, how are we doing on time? 702. What, 702? Yeah, I think we're good. I can get this done. Okay. So, um, a couple months ago I was in Singapore there were 2,000 coaches in the audience. There were five of us. There was a panel to start off with. And then you had a presentation in front of the entire group. And then you had workshops. And then you came back to another presentation uh, where people went through three and a half days, grueling days. And then they were able to ask you questions, the five of us as we were up there. Um, my point of mention is that uh, the preparation for that was um, I had a laptop, and all I did was take sound bites of great athletes that had achieved phenomenal things. Whether it was Phelps and it was swimming, or it could be uh, somebody that was devastated because he lost the gold medal by one one hundredth of a second, or it could be, and it was a, a whole potpourri of things. So the feedback. Uh, when I did the presentation was we were expecting more basketball. We wanted things. And uh, the feedback was, um, well, you know, everybody else went to things, but they really didn't talk about what makes an athlete tick and how to help coaches in Singapore. And in Singapore, within the first three hours, I learned that the emotions of the coaches over there is really down. They pay an extreme amount of money to pluck the eyes of the fish out of coaches that are really good at what they do, whether it's field hockey, it could be swimming, or whatever, and they pay them a lot of money. And they go over there and they find out that the culture is such that the children are raised on 12, 14 hours a day of academics. Everything's about electronics. Everything's about, uh, you know, three languages, not one, et cetera, et cetera. But you have a lot of what I would call drag assing around with player and coaches. The players, uh, the coaches feel like they're in prison. They've had their hearts ripped out because there's no real competition. So they're on this long journey of, of paying their light bills, but there's, they're, I mean, they're not playing for anything. Singapore doesn't have an Olympic team. There, there's no, it's just you do a job, you go to your, do your practice. The facilities are phenomenal. Okay, why that story, why now? And my point is that any book you read over the last 10 years, they say know your why, know your purpose. What drives you in a given day? And then service that, and then the bouquet of flowers, whatever that may be, will come to you because you're attractive in your energy. You have a certain aura about you. You're somebody people want to be around because you have charisma, because you know that you're in your place. You're where you're supposed to be. So my point is that, that while I enjoyed it over there, I felt really sad when I got on the plane because I don't know that feeling and I ne have never seen so many coaches and players that were just going through the motions of doing athletics because somebody told them that they had to. And so lessons learned. You have to fight every day for your own purpose to know why you're doing what you're doing, when and how to do it, and say what's going to drive me is a smile, a compliment. I'm going to give somebody a good day because it's going to be genuine, but I'm going to look for those things that they're doing well. We say praise, prompt, and leave. You can go praise, correct, and then leave it alone. Walk away from it. But you will be where your eyes look. And so I think it's really, really important that that's why I'm a, I, I love coaches. 
I don't care what sport it is, but I hurt for a lot of coaches because I think they're suffering because they've lost their purpose. They're not sure why they're doing what they're doing. And I'm telling you that that right there, the youth, the energy that they will give you, the call that you will get, good, bad, or indifferent, means you have a relationship with somebody of trust. And so I think it's really, really important that as you leave this clinic, that you kind of do a self-search of where you're at with your career at this particular time and take an evaluation and see if you know you're spending enough time at smiling and, and enjoying what you're doing of saying hey man we we get to we don't have to i think that's really really important okay so i'm going to go to my little thing here all right and i'm going to go leadership and i i know about as much as electronics as nobody but i go to my leadership notes and i, I covered the five laws of learning what they don't tell you about these five laws, teach it really slow. If you get accused of anything and you say, I don't, I'm nervous and anxious about the next thing that I've got to teach, then see if you can eliminate it in your practice plan to simplify the practice plan so that whatever you're teaching, you do really, really well. Err on the side of less plays and more read and react within that play. Have the play, but then, okay, they take the denial away on the Iverson cut, what then? And if they take that away, what then? In other words, just squeeze that play to its exhaustion before you go to the next play, and you'll find that the next play will be a lot better because of what you did with the first play, because it was read and react, it was move and counter. Hey, if they deny that back door, just clear that side and we'll go into a step up and play a two-man game on that side and get us a triangle on the weak side. Play ball. You know, and if they stop that, swing it and go into another step up, leave the corner open and get them out of there. All right. Second is, ask questions. I am sheet. Do you have an I am sheet on your players? I am and you say, favorite food, all right? Favorite movie, one book that you would take to the moon, all right? One thing that you treasure more than anything else. And create two to three pages of that, give it to your players and have them bring it back to you or do it right then and take an hour. So when they fill it out, you bring it home and you read it and you go, oh my God. I will promise you that you can live with somebody for 36, 36, 37 years and you say, you make out one page of five questions, I'll make out one page of five questions, and you say, I'll have every answer right. No, you won't. You won't. It's amazing what you can learn like that by having an I am sheet for your players. You know, questions that have to do with the care factor and who they are. Worst tragedy in their life. And maybe it was an uncle that was really important to them and then you get it on a piece of paper and you let it fester in you for a month. And then you say, hey, let's catch up. Tell me about your uncle. And then all of a sudden it comes out. That stuff is what builds the house because they got to know that you care first before you can coach them. All right. Shadow teaching, all right? When you do this drill, let me have one of the players here. Okay, and give me another player. I get asked this question all the time, and it's about physicality. Okay, all I want you to do is, demonstration is, I want you to do that, like that, with him. Okay, now you do that, back to him. All right, now get down in the defensive stance. Okay, now same thing. All right, and then you just jump stop forward if you get knocked off balance. Okay, here we go. Good. Okay, good. All right, here we go. You get a pop. Good. Okay, good. Do you guys know the swim move? All right, swim move is I'm going to demonstrate it so I'm here and I come through here. And then you'll be facing this way. You turn around and you swim move some. All right, let's see it. Good. All right, now you do him on a swim move. Okay, here we go. And all right, now. You're at the 45, you're there, and we're teammates, all right? And you're there. 
And you full denial him, so I can't pass the ball there. I want you to walk two steps to me, and with your left arm, all right, you're going to slap his back and bring your right arm in back door, cut him. All right, do it again, and make sure that it's really quick. Now I'll be you, and you be me. All right, and I'm going to be gentle on this, but I'm going to walk you this way. All right, deny me. All right, now I just keep walking him up for the space. What did Coach tell you? To deny me, right? Yeah. So now I take two or three. Go ahead and step up, and I hit here. I'm not getting it. And then I go here, and I grab the calf, and I'm throwing him this way while I'm coming this way. All right, and so now you take two minutes, and you show him how to back door with physicality against denial. It's two minutes. And you're arming them with how to play against physicality. Okay, thank you. My point is that we're in such a rush that, you know, how do you get your teams to play physical? Because you're in that six-inch space and you're constantly teaching them how to play with, to be physical or to receive physicality. You've got somebody holding you and you're not, you know, hand speed and, and saying, come on back out. Just Green Bay Packers. I'm with the Green Bay Packers a couple months ago, and they have this stupid little drill, which we've done for years. All, right, all I want you to do is grab his jersey with your fist. You, got you grab his jersey with your fist. All right? Okay, now, if you want to break that hand off of there, just go right after that elbow underneath. All right? I just do it really like you're trying to be discreet with the official, and I'm the official here. Do the same thing. And then go, all right, now, do it really hard because he's just friggin' holding you. All right, here, all right, now, let's say that he did that and do that to me, all right, and hold on to it. Now the ball's there, and I just am here, and I'm here, okay? Uh, see, what happens is that when the game happens, we've told them about what the officials will do or won't do, and we're not helping him or her get open against the physicality. We're watching it from the sideline and we're going, we're getting our asses beat and they're out physical in us. Well, I promise you they're fouling you. And yet you're going to whine factor, you're going to piss and moan with the officials and you say, you know what, I have to own that. And there's got to be a degree of that in your practices. Hand-to-hand -hand combat. And if you're not getting that across, you're in deep trouble. Thanks, guys. I could go into that for a while. Okay, physicality. All right. I'm going to reverse this real quick. Thoughts on improvement. Read books, internet articles, magazines, anything that challenges your thinking. Are you somebody who constantly is just going to books that are your comfort zone as opposed to reading something that makes you uncomfortable? You're a slow down coach. You just want to go after Dick Bennett and everything it was about keeping the tempo low. Well, I would suggest to you to stretch your mind and to help your slow down game, study what the up tempo coaches are doing. Make yourself uncomfortable at times. We associate with our comfort zone before we're uncomfortable. This is extremely uncomfortable for me. I do not like talking in front of groups. I don't like it. I was gone for about an hour, walking, you know, and, and it will always be that way. But my point is, is that attack what makes you uncomfortable, all right? Number two, field studies means that you're always going out there. Manly played in Vegas about, I don't know, 10 days ago, and uh, because of Brian Gorgian told me about a Zoom group I jumped in on Alita out of Adelaide, and I met Anthony Siebel. On, the, on that, well, then I went over to Vegas, and I watched him for two days do what they do. Incredible. I'm not even, like, I don't even know about rugby. I know about teaching. I know about chunking. I know about, but my point is not about me, but be a learner your whole time. Go watch other people. Like, I know that somebody within your community is the teacher of the year. So you call him or her up and say, do you mind if I come into your classroom on a Tuesday and then wait a month and go in on another Tuesday? And I, it's amazing what you'll pick up and how that teacher of the year or that, that best in the building does their job. It's amazing. All right, so be on the hunt for field studies. Number three, 
Write down a small list of your weaknesses. Map out a plan to improve. And do a monthly review with a trusted friend who will tell you that you have spinach in your teeth. You know, you want to have certain people that you trust tell you things you don't want to hear. That call you out. Unfortunately, I have a wife that does that. Okay, number four, get a physical once a year. That creates a database. This is for you. Blood level, you know, sugar level, whatever. But then you know five years later, you go, damn, same weight. I'm doing okay. Blood pressure's there. But my point is, if you don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. And I think it's really important. All right, number five, I told you about savers. Number six, mentor committee. You pick people that you want that you can go to in a crisis that you can call. And if you don't have anybody, then you need to have a committee. The second point, that's a sub point, is as you get older, make sure you have younger around you. Younger knows what's coming up river next, and it's important because when we get older, we have a tendency to see people drop off. And then we have nobody left at the table. Well, the great thing about coaching is, is that you're always coaching younger than you, so you're getting invited to young events, and you learn things. So I think it's important that in your committee that you have a variance of old, young people that tell you things you don't want to hear, but you need a committee of people that mentor you your whole life. Really, really important. Number seven, treasure hunt, meaning add one or two young coaches as you get older. Number eight, write notes and mail outs. You know what? Everybody texts a little note. Thank you, da 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 da. But when's the last time you just wrote a note to somebody, got their address, and thanked them for spending time with you or whatever it is, and you took the time to put that in the mailbox? That's like a piece of gold. You can hold it. It's something. And it makes you different. All right? So I do think that's really important. Team retreat. Start each year with some sort of a get to know you adventure, even if it's limited to the high school or the club where you coach. So you say, hey, we're going to come in here and we're going to have some food outside and we're going to do this because of the optics, the money, how it would look, whatever. All you're doing is making excuses of why you don't do some sort of a team retreat. Maybe you meet at a, a local park, and then you have a plan for things that have to do with, Coach, do you remember that day when we went to the park, and we had the water balloon fight, and then we did this, and we did that, and we sat around, and each person had to tell something in the circle about themselves no one else knew. You know, and it could be something fun that they just don't know. And then you'll get somebody singing. I swear to God, you know, and you go like, whoa, <laughs> that's pretty good. And my point is, is that team retreats are really, really important. All right, vow to randomly ask 10 people in your building if you are negative or positive with your energy. Let them answer. Let them answer. Do you have the courage to say, hey, am I filling the tank up or am I pulling the fuel out? You're one or the other. All right, organize your basketball clips so that you can easily find your basketball system and also your own blueprint so you are interview ready. Okay, you say, well, that's just too much for me. Have your own mission statement. Somebody says, well, what, you know, what's your mission statement? And you say, make it one sentence. You know, I'm a learner, I'm a competitor, I love youth, and I, I consider myself a teacher. I'm a winner. If you're not going to put that out there, well, why do you think somebody else is going to? Tell people who you are, and you don't have to be, you know, obnoxious about it. Whatever your mission statement is, but have your own mission statement. Here's what my offensive philosophy is. Here's what my defensive philosophy is. Here's some um, four of my favorite drills, and let's say it's three pages. That's your notebook. You give it to them, and they go, dang, that's pretty good, and then you just build on it but you should have some sort of a note basketball notebook for yourself. Awareness is a superpower. I covered that. Every staff and team has a male, a person who talks about you and team to others, um, or a mole, all right? 
So I'm in a staff meeting at St. John's. Gene Candy, who's a Hall of Fame coach from Purdue, had all of his wins there, has a John Deere hat in, and he came late uh, in terms of being added to our staff. He sits down at the head of the table, the door's closed, Steve Lavin hasn't come in yet, and he goes, who's the mole? <laughs> and, and I'm just sitting at the end of the table minding my own business. And he goes, one of these son of a bitches is a mole. I'm telling you, because every staff has somebody, loose lips, sink ships, and they always do. Somebody talks outside. So when you're having your meetings and you're doing what you're doing, don't worry about the mole. You have one. Worry about yourself and what you're saying in your temper and uh, your temperament and say, hey, I, I lived a clean day. I'm proud of myself for being stoic when all this stuff over here happened and I kept my poise as opposed to the blame game or you think nobody's looking or you're saying, hey, we've got a secret. You don't have secrets. Somebody in your staff is going to le leak that out. I promise you. I promise you. And so my point is, quit looking at the mole and just know it's a reality and take care of your own behavior. That's what I've got to say about moles. Don't ever think you can't be fired. As a matter of fact, think just the opposite. Be grateful and openly thank people for your opportunity. So in other words, plan your own funeral. Organize your own funeral. And I mean being fired. And if you're shown the door, thank them for the opportunity. I'm telling you one thing, when you do that, you're not carrying bitterness with you, you're dealing with it on the day. I think it's really, really important. I've been fired, and it doesn't feel good. But when I really look at it, I say, well, that's on me. That was on me. I could have been better. And I say, okay, here are the three things that I learned. Be a better delegator. So see, I'm not just BSing you. If I had been more trusting and delegated better, that would have helped the end result. Two is, be more patient. I'm impatient by nature, and I want things now. And I've been more patient. Three is be a better listener. Okay, I have no problem today saying that in front of you, but the day after, I had a big problem, and the problem was me. In other words, it's not terminal. You're going to coach if you want to coach again. But my point is, don't ever think that you're bulletproof, because you're not. Uh, do not complain. Yep, keep a running list of things that need to improve. Then go about changing them. If you see something in a given day that's pissing you off, well then, are you thinking in solutions or are you just going to gripe about it? Think about who you are and what you're going to do. You know, and it's like my dad said, hey, if you want to go to Lenny Wilkins' camp, you figure out how to pay for the camp and I'll pay for the ticket. So I just started my own lawn mowing business and I was 11 years old. And I got enough money to scratch together to go to the camp that led me to Westmont, that led me to, you know, uh, this career to be in here because you take a, a, a view of am I just somebody who complains all the time about things that don't go my way communication is lifeblood of organization think like the IRS doing an audit only thing that counts about the records are you, that you keep also keep your bosses informed of your progress and setbacks get to them first bad news travels fast my point is that there's going to be some things that happen. Get up the food chain and don't always just think that you're going to only tell them good things. Right? They'll trust you uh, more than if you are the first one to get to the bearer of bad tidings, some things happen. If you think you're going to keep secrets or, or manipulate it, it never turns out. In other words, have a form of communication and you are the heartbeat on that. Uphill and with your players. Not necessarily they're downhill, but I'm just saying is that we have to understand that communication is the lifeblood and being honest counts. You know, with what happens to you, it's liberating. But the more you keep secrets, the more it weighs on you and you become miserable. Anything that involves money, be super careful and report everything. I've seen more coaches get into trouble by messing around with money than anything else. In other words, you're given a stipend by the school or the club and whatever. You are how you document how you spend that money. Don't think it's going to go away or they won't pay attention to this or that. They always do. All right, last one. 20, team. Keep it small 
and manageable, whether it's your staff or your team. You know, somebody comes to you and they say, well, add this kid or add that kid or whatever, but the kid is, is, didn't want to be there anyway. You're doing somebody a favor by, and you're not sure, don't do it. I know for a fact that those kind of things will bite you in the rear end. Try not to do those things. Okay. Um, how many of you know that out of that group over there, the type of learners that are in that gaggle of players? What? What kind of learners are there? They go into categories, and there's four of them. And they'll tip their hand to you when they go, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying, coach. They're auditory. All right? I see what you're saying, coach. They're visual. Third, write it. They're writers. They need to write it down in order to really take it in. I'm a writer. I was in a freshman class of 360, it was Western Civ, it was dual taught, and both professors wrote the book on Western Civ. I was way, and it was what they call a weeder class. And I know for a fact I was in deep trouble, but they were tape recording the classes, and I just by, you know, dumb luck, I went to the library because I was scared of the exams that the teachers were going to give, so I was able to auditorily listen, but I wrote it down and I remembered what they said. So I was able to get through that Western Civ class and that taught me that I had to write things down. And then finally, kinesthetic learners. You put your arm around their waist, you walk them in a, a V cut here, and then you move them out up here, and they're intrinsically, they feel things, and so you say, hey, that kid's a visual learner. There was no better teacher in the world that I ever saw than Tim Gergovich. And constantly I was like, man, what makes this guy so special? What's he doing? He constantly had his hands on the players. Players that everyone else said somebody else couldn't coach. Oh, those guys at Vegas, they're not very smart. And here's Coach Gerg moving them around, and he's making sure and check-ins. He'd say, do you understand? Do you, no, no, Coach, I don't. What is that? You know, and he'd say, okay. This is a stack curl. So, you know, Butler's going to come down here. You wrap his waist, and then you dozy doe, and you come around, and you spit yourself out the other way, or you screen this guy, and he's going to pop out to the wing, and you post up. My point is, is that I didn't know what that kind of teaching was. And so you say, well, you know, okay, there's four different types of learners over there. Be a hybrid coach. And so when you're doing the five laws of learning, you know, make sure that you're dipping in to somebody that maybe is a little bit of everything, and let's say he or she's ADHD. Well, you're going to have to kinesthetically move them around. You're going to have to be a little bit more patient because they're really keeping a secret. They're ashamed that they don't know what their partner knows next to them. And you have to say, hey, it's okay. We got this. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm just like you. In other words, validate them and then go forward on that. Okay, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to go into a little bit of Q&A. Yeah, I've exceeded my time. I always do. I'm not really stressing. This is my one opportunity to be before you. But if you wanted to ask me questions about the Bucks, uh, I work for Michael Jordan, big deal. But my point is, if you want to know about Charlotte, you want to know about St. John's, Iowa, USC, whatever, it's a dog's meal of a, of a resume. So my point is that ask your questions. Doesn't matter to me. Coach. Yes. Not for tonight, Chris. Awesome. Um, you talked at the beginning about uh, goal-focused practices. Can I just ask, imagining that was your team and that drill you took us through was your practice, where would you want your team to be at the end of that session of that activity in terms of what what your goal might be? Uh, mine would be it, catching and passing. Whether they scored one bucket, I could care less. But, you know, on our way to pressure release opposite, because we're getting in our press attack, we're getting in middle attack from opposite, that's really hard to defend. And then when you get the ball into the middle of the floor, you're gutting your defense. 
you know, so whether it's a press attack, they don't want it there because then you're able to swing it opposite. You can drive it right down the middle at times, but your options are multiple from the middle of the floor and owning the middle of the floor. But if, if you said one answer, it'd be passing and catching. And two is it just defensively, it's okay to get beat with the dribble. It's okay to do A, B, and C, but it's not okay not to touch whoever you're defending. Get in. All right, now they're not in a good help position. I could care less. Ownership on the five, letting them get in and get comfortable with the six-inch shown. So I would say getting in, fouling, I wouldn't call any fouls at all. I, w I, w I would say ball pressure would be that, and then passing and catching would be over here. Obviously, I'll, we'll get to the communication and all those things. But if you leave your first practice and they're all over the ball, you know what ball pressure is? It's disruption. So anyway, I'm having a conversation with Coach Budenholzer, head coach formerly of the Milwaukee Bucks. And, you know, we have schemes for pick and roll. And I said to him early on, I said, why don't we hedge? I said, Coach, if you ask anybody that's a point guard what they hate most, they don't want to see defense. They don't care about drop. I said, Chris Paul, and you put Chris Paul in a drop, he will kick your ass. You know, so I said, why don't we, we hedge? Anyway, he doesn't believe in it, doesn't want it, doesn't want his bigs up, you know, whether it's Brooke or this guy or that guy. So anyway, they're going to the Olympics, you know, and we have our Olympic team. And I said to him, I said, Coach, are you going to the Olympics? You know, and, and he said, yeah, I'm going to go for just the metal round. I said, okay, well, watch Australia. He goes, why? <laughs> and I go, they hedge. And I said, they're really good at it, like that. And he goes, okay. So anyway, he comes back and he goes, holy Christ. He said, they're really good at the hedging, you know. And I said, I told you, coach. I said, you know, and it was a hell of a game, right? It was an unbelievable game. But my, my, my point is that on that, um, as you're building things, I would say the first week, you got to let your team know that we win the games with passing. You know, eventually, if you're going to isolation and it's a pound fest, Golden State, their dynasty, <laughs> cutting, you know, et cetera. And if you go through the dynasties, the pass, the pass, the pass. And it doesn't have to be three sides doesn't have to, but they're, they're going to have to willingly let go of the ball and then catching the ball. And the, the nasty little thing is turnovers, you know, decision making, how they're doing that. And if you want clean decision making, then take responsibilities away. Don't add responsibilities. We're coming down on a three on two and you're telling them six things. No, if you said on three on twos, we want the three and we want corners filled, on all three on twos and we want you to stutter step on every time you come there and then go for the layup if you want but I'd rather have the three than the layup and if you told them that you would reduce your turnovers my point is that not advocating for that but I think that when we see turnovers there's something that's happening that's a thing that when they do transition drills that they're doing too much of that's creating the mistake. It's over here in the kettle of things. And then over here is the who. And if the who is constantly turning the ball over and they have a high turnover rate, then you have to do addition by subtraction. One of two ways. One is limit what they can do when they're coming down the floor until they can prove that they're not going to turn the ball over or uh, sub their ass out and put them on the bench. <laughs> because it's, it's a person that's creating that, but when you have a lot of turnovers and you're trying to win championships, you're done. You can't turn that ball over, and it's just like footy. If you're constantly turning the ball over, you're going to be in deep, deep trouble. You know, so. Yeah. Next question, yeah. Peter. Do you have a formula oh. for providing um, player feedback? Loud, please. Do you have a formula for providing player feedback? Uh, yeah. Uh, number one is the formula is they trust you and they'll converse with you uh, typically when it's in a neutral zone. Don't do it in your office. Find out where, you know, players like to talk over food. It's primal. So when they're eating, it's like carpool. When you're driving your kids around, they say everything because they forget you're driving them around. And then the, the information comes out. 
Well, it's the same thing when you have a good meal or you're having a sandwich with them and it's at a place where it's neutral. It's different than in your office because that's your power spot. Okay, if you're going to do it in the gym, you, uh, you know, assign it formula is that you're going to rebound for them and yet it's a side when there's no audience. And now you're rebounding for them and you're using the ball in order to be the trust object. Like when children are violated in any form, abused, hit, whatever, the psychologist is always working through a different medium. They don't go directly at the issue. So if it's a truck, a doll, or whatever, they'll start saying, hey, yeah, like I have that same truck. I have that same doll. So my point is when you're dealing with players and you want communication, you have to go to areas that they're comfortable before you're going to get a release of the information of whatever you're after. Uh, another point, I am sheets is a form of communication. You know, and, our, and then you do a sheet for them and you do an I am sheet and you hand it out to your team so that they know more about who you are. All right. The other thing is, is that say you have pods and you have assistants. You say, okay, I want you to be on Dunlap and I want you to be on Johnson and I want you to be on Billy Tomlinson and come back in a week's time. Make it where it's really organic, where it's happened naturally, but I want you to ask them, you know, these three things uh, in terms of who are you upset with? Who's a ball hog on our team? Who pisses you off? And see if you can get that information. Just they release the information, sometimes the problem's been solved by the fact that they were able to tell the coach that they think that Dunlap's a dickhead. So that's a formula, using your assistance to go to pods to get the communication. But all things are habits, and good habits are hard to break, so that you are overtly trying to garden by saying that on Tuesdays you always go to Gorgian and we're going to have 10 minutes before you come 10 minutes early and we'll have a yak. And they're called check-ins. So that when the storm comes, you're just not there for that communication. You know, and the other last thing I would like to say is this, is that in nurturing relationships, any relationship at all, it has to do with telling people what you like, what makes you happy, what makes you feel good. And I don't think we do enough of that. You know, that we come into the house and we go, da 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 boom. And it's like, I'm going to, with intent, I'm not, it's not fake, but like you say, with intent, I'm going to tell the player, hey, that was great. Yesterday you had three on grounds and you dug out three 50-50 balls. That's unbelievable. And they're going, coach, I can't score to save my life. I'm dog shit. And you're going, yeah, okay, well, fine. You know, but this is what I like. You say, I understand you're frustrated, I validated, but I'm just going to tell you right now, if we don't have you in our group, we're not winning. And all of a sudden, hey, you know, shooting becomes less of an issue. You see what I'm saying? So those are check-ins that are powerful as well. But my point is this, is that when you come into the gym and when you're coaching, your position is like this. You're like this the entire time you coach a team. In other words, you have to be ready in order to observe. You're on night watch. You're paying attention. You're like this because it's that important to you. Okay, now, you say, well, what about other things in my life? And that's called thinking in priorities. And write this down, coaches. The power of no. If your priorities are set and you say, you know, I have my family, I'm going to go to my son's game here, bop, 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 or my daughter's game, then saying no is really easy. But what happens is you forget your priority. And you say, okay, I'm going to communicate with the team. Well, how are you going to communicate? Well, we're going to ask questions. We're just going to ask questions, and here are the questions we're going to ask, you know, to your assistants or for you. And then... You can organize that with your group. You can organize it with a pod or one-on-one. -on -one. So there's a skill to this. But for you, I think, it, and all coaches, you've got to know how to say no because you can't be all things to all people. But the beginning of freeing yourself up to be happy is saying, well, I can't do that, and I can't get over here and do that. And that is the power of no really liberates you so that you can focus on the things that you need to be doing.
Coach, I'm a, I'm a coach. I got two practices a week, maybe an hour and a half each session, which I would think a lot of these guys are. Would you say teaching in that time you would work through what you just went through, teaching more in the hole, whether it be three on three, four, four, or five, five? Uh, at this stage, if you've got limited time and resources, in other words, there's people coming in behind you and you're waiting to get onto the floor, do as much four on four and five on five as you can. Forget about the drills, just coach the hole as much as you can, and then work your way down the road to a drill or two that will help the hole but you're going to learn more about your players and who plays well together and strengths and weaknesses out of the hole. And a lot of coaches, their teams start slow because they don't do enough hole. So, yeah, and, and the, the better players want to play. And uh, you can teach out of the hole and stop them a little bit to correct something. But you'll get a lot more yardage out of that both happy factor with your players if you're playing fours and fives than you are if you're just uh, you know, going to drills. Am I saying don't drill? No, I think you need to drill, but I think you need to delay that for a while until you're really going, and especially with time constraints. Yeah. I, I would say a lot of people don't see their team more than twice a week for an hour and a half, maybe some other. Uh, raise your hand if you only see your team twice a week or, or less. Yeah. And so that's why your practice plan is really important. And my point is about practice plans is any English paper that you write, when you rewrite it, it gets better. And then rewrite your practice plan at least three times, you know, and see what you can eliminate. And you may add something too. I'm not saying never add something, but keep your practice plan brutally simple two or three things on offense, two or three things on defense, and then decide if you're a defensive coach or an offensive coach, and then tilt the practice more towards that. I'm a defensive coach, and then what was liberating for me is when I looked at the practice plan, and let's say I had an hour, we were going to do at least 40 minutes of defense. Well, we, were, we learned to transition out of the defense to go to offense, so we were stealing some time offensively to reward it, but if someone said, boy, that was a defensive practice, i say, you bet it is. You know, and that's just the way we were. Because you're one or the other. Questions? Yep, I got one. Yep. As a coach, how do you balance trying to enforce your plan and dealing with the players you have and adapting to what they're capable of and working that out as you go? Very good question. Uh, the question is, you know, you see your talent and then you have a system. And my point is, is that hold your system to your left in your pocket, see what you have, and then tilt and drop some of the things that you would have as your system once you recognize that your talent is such. You may have an offense, but your bigs uh, make bad decisions and so you can shortcut that so to speak by saying I'm not going to have the ball in their hands a lot but they're going to and I'm going to tweak the offense so that they're more screening and that they're rolling to the basket so they're closer if they do receive the ball and they have a chance to put it in but I'm not going to have them pop and I'm going to sure the hell not going to have them get the ball in a horn set and all of a sudden start to make decisions and and do all of this stuff when they're just not very good there you're going to work on that down the road but I would say that your talent and what you have is more important than your actual stone-cold system.